I think we lost him. <laughs> Stupid dragon. <gasps> Hey, it's the Doc, and welcome to episode 3, part 2, creating your first character. Uh, we're going to be creating Palindrone Bob, a first level neutral good dwarf cleric, and we're going to start from the ground up. As we're not going to be using the basic rules here, we will need a 5th edition player's handbook. We'll need a copy of a 5th edition character sheet, which you can find online or grab out of the handbook, or I'll put a link in the description for you. We're going to need a dice set, a pencil, and some scrap paper. Also, <laughs> highly recommend some post-it notes to mark some pages in the handbook. Ooh, and we're coming out of the gate with part one. Now, part one is going to talk about our stats or our ability points. What these are, are their six characteristics that have numbers assigned to them that determine your character's skills, abilities, how others react to him or her in the world, and pretty much form the basis of your character's strengths and weaknesses. We'll be determining the values of these six characteristics through rolling random numbers on the dice. Now there are a few methods of doing this. I'm going to show you the most common method and then I'm going to show you a slight variation which is what I use. In the common method you take a six-sided die and you roll it four times. You take the three largest numbers you rolled, drop the lowest number, and add them up. Adam. Repeat that six times to generate six random numbers, which will end up being obviously between uh, 3 and 18. Obviously. Now, I tend to use that method myself, but I put a slight variation in there to benefit the players a little bit. What I'll do is when they roll those four six-sided dice, if they roll a one, I'll have them re-roll it. So in the end, they're going to generate six numbers, but instead of being six numbers between 3 and 18, they're going to be six numbers between 6 and 18. You're too nice. So take your rolls, generate your numbers, write them down, and put them aside. Uh, we're going to be using them in a little bit. Write it down, put it aside. Uh, I'm going to take a little break here and give you a uh, public service announcement. PSA. I would highly suggest that in your player's handbook, you take a post-it note and stick a post-it on each one of these pages. Uh, you're going to be flipping back and forth like crazy between them. And having them post it there or some sort of bookmark is going to save you a heck of a lot of time. For part two, we're going to take a look at that character sheet. This is the lifeblood of your alter ego in Dungeons and & Dragons and contains everything about you. What you're seeing here on the left is the primary character sheet. And that's the one we're going to be covering today. The one on the right is a sheet for spellcasters, clerics, wizards. Helps you keep track of your magic, what spells you have, etc. We'll be covering that in a future episode. For now, we're just going to take a look at that primary sheet. And by the end of this episode, this is going to be totally filled out and you'll be ready to play. Now, the first place we're going to visit on this sheet is in the top center, where all our basic information is kept. We're going to fill out the name Palindrone Bob. He is a first level cleric. His race is a hill dwarf. His alignment is neutral good. He has zero experience points as he just started playing. And Doc, that's me. He's my character. Which now brings us to part three. part three. The six main stats or ability points that we rolled those numbers for before. And here they are on the left side of the page. To the left. There's six of them. The first is strength, how strong you are. It's used for close combat attacks, how much you can carry. Your dexterity is how fast you can move and dodge, how good your hand-eye coordination is, it's used for distance attacks. Your constitution is how tough you are, how much damage you could take. Your intelligence, how smart you are, how many spells you might have. Your wisdom is your worldly experience, your ability to perceive things going on around you. And your charisma is your looks and attitude and how the world interacts with you and what type of garbage you can get away with. The first thing we're going to do while filling in these numbers is we're going to look at a little detail here. Palindrone Bob is a dwarf. Now, races in Dungeons and Dragons all get different ability modifiers to add to those numbers on the left. In order to figure out what Bobs are, we're going to go to the player's handbook and we're going to look up dwarves and we're going to find the information we need. And we're finding it on the player's handbook, pages 18, 19, 20 the section regarding dwarves, and we could see here under dwarf traits, right up top, 
Ability score increase. Your constitution score increases by two. Now, if we keep reading, we'll also see that Bob is a hill dwarf. And hill dwarves, in addition to the constitution bonus, get a wisdom bonus of plus one. We go back to the character sheet, and next to constitution, we write a plus two. And next to wisdom, we write a plus one. Now that we have those bonuses sorted out, we've got to figure out where we're going to take those numbers we rolled earlier and what abilities we're going to put those numbers into. Now, in D&D, each class has particular strengths and weaknesses. For example, a fighter would want a high strength. Punch, punch, a wizard punch. would want a high intelligence. Spell, spell, spell. Let's figure out what we need to do for the cleric. Now, we can do this by going to the player's handbook on page 56, and there's a small section down here that says Quick Build. Quick Build, quick build is almost like a cheat section for each character class. It goes into details on the best build for the class and what you need to really invest your points in. And we can see here for a cleric that Wisdom should be the highest ability score, wisdom. followed by Strength or Constitution. The logic behind this is that wisdom is utilized by clerics for spell casting. The higher their wisdom, the better the spells. But they can also hold their own in a fight. They could either take additional strength to hit harder or additional constitution in order to be more like a tank and have some survivability. So we're going to go back to our character sheet again and we're going to focus on getting a high wisdom. We now pull out that sheet of numbers that we rolled earlier, and here's where it all comes into play. We're going to need a high wisdom, so we're going to take that 17, put it in the wisdom, add the plus 1, and our wisdom becomes 18. 18 we're going to go more for survivability over hit power, so we're going to take that 15, put it in constitution, add the 2 bonus, and we have a 17 constitution. We're going to take the other 15, and put it in strength so we have some hitting power. Smash, We're going to take our 12s and put them in dexterity and charisma. So we have a little bit of speed and pretty average looks. But I'm super and lastly, we're going to take our 9 and put it in intelligence, which arguably with a cleric build is one of the least used traits. Which brings us to part 4, oh, figuring out the ability score modifiers. You'll notice under those numbers we just put in are these small ovals. They're there for a purpose. Why? What happens here is based upon your skill level and your number, you get a bonus that applies to actions that you will perform using that ability. We jaunt over to the player's handbook and we go to page 13 and we look at this chart in the top right. That chart shows us our ability scores and their modifiers. This helps determine whether or not we get advantages or disadvantages based upon our skills. For example, if we had a strength of 15, we're relatively strong. We would get a plus 2 when we're utilizing, say, a sword. If we have a strength of 4, we're nowhere near as strong. We can't use the sword anywhere near as well. And we would get a negative 3 modifier to it. So let's figure out Bob's numbers. From the top down, Bob has a 15 strength, which gives him a plus 2, a 12 dexterity that gives him a plus 1, a 17 constitution for a plus 3, a 9 intelligence for a negative 1, an 18 wisdom for a plus 4, and a 12 charisma for a plus 1. And how this affects the game is that if Bob has to do anything that involves a strength check, if he has to hold up a roof or push open a door, whatever role he makes, he gets a plus two for. Anything requiring intelligence, he gets a negative one on the roll, and so on. Part five, inspiration, proficiencies, and saving throws. We're going to start working down the column to the right of the ability scores. And the first thing we're going to do is we're not going to worry about inspiration. That is a mechanic a dungeon master may or may not use, and it's not important right now for you. What we are going to use is this proficiency bonus here, and let's show you how we figure that out. It's as easy as going to the player's handbook, page 5657, under cleric once again, looking at this chart in the top right, and as a first level cleric, we get a proficiency bonus of plus two. We head back over to the character sheet and write the plus two in the proficiency bonus slot. Simple as that.
You'll see where this comes into play in just a few minutes. For now, let's move down. Underneath the proficiency bonus area is an area that says saving throws. Saving throws are pretty much what they sound like. Uh, at points during your campaign, your dungeon master may say, roll a save. And what the save may do is it may mitigate damage, it may prevent the party from taking any damage. It could be the difference between life and death or success and failure. And like everything else in the game, there are modifiers for this, except in this case, the modifiers are based on your class, not your race. So we're back over to the player's handbook, page 57, under Cleric Class Features. And you'll see here under Proficiency, Saving Throws. And we could see as a Cleric, we get a proficiency in saving throws on Wisdom and Charisma. Back to our character sheet, and in those saving throws, we fill in a little black dot in that circle next to Wisdom and Charisma. That indicates that we have an additional proficiency in them. Once those dots are filled in, we're ready to start transposing numbers. Our strength saving throw is simply our strength bonus of plus two. Our dexterity saving throw, plus one. Our constitution, plus three. Our intelligence, negative one. When it comes to wisdom, we have a plus four, but we're proficient. So we add the proficiency bonus for a plus six. The same with charisma. We have a plus one, we're proficient. We add the two proficiency bonus for a total of plus three. And that pretty much wraps up the section on saving throws. So let's move down to skills just below. And this opens our new section as well. Skills, details, personalities, and your backstory. So underneath those saving throws, you'll see that skills area, which has a whole bunch of interesting stuff in it. Everything from acrobatics and animal handling to investigation and sleight of hand. These are little skills that your character may have that makes him or her unique in the world and adds a little bit of personality. If you want to play like Batman, take stealth and investigation. If you want to entertain people at the bar, take sleight of hand. If you want to stabilize a dying character, take medicine. Uh, possibilities are pretty wide open. To determine what skills you'll have access to, there's two things that are important. The first is your class. As a cleric, we go back to the handbook. Under the cleric section, class features, we see skills, and we can choose two. And in Bob's case, we're going to take insight and medicine. So we'll head back over to the player's sheet where... Next to Insight and Medicine, we'll fill in those black dots, Perfect. noting that we're proficient in them. The second aspect that Hello. helps determine your skills is your background, or what you were before you were an adventurer. There's a whole section here in Chapter 4 of the Player's Handbook on personality and background. It goes over languages and alignments and a whole slew of uh, different past histories. In Bob's case, we're going to dig through these backgrounds, and we're going to decide that before Bob was an adventuring cleric, he was a sailor. Perhaps he was the medic on a ship, and his spells are going to be based around wind and water and healing. It's totally up to us to make the character unique. But what we want to look at right now is under Sailor, you'll see skill proficiencies. And there are skill proficiencies for athletics and perception. So, we head back over to the character sheet, and as we're heading towards that left column, let's stop in the top center and fill in Sailor as the background. Then we proceed over to the left, and we fill in the little black dots next to Athletics and Perception to show we have proficiency in them. Perfection. Now, let's zoom in on that Skills column, and you'll notice that next to each skill are parentheses with uh, one of the attributes in there, Dexterity, Wisdom, Intelligence, Strength, that shows what bonus is associated with that skill. And in addition, anyone that has a black dot gets the additional plus two proficiency bonus. So Acrobatics is based on Dexterity, it gets a plus one. Animal Handling, based on Wisdom, gets a plus four. Arcana, I say Arcana, you say Arcana, is based on Intelligence, so it gets a negative 1. And Athletics, it gets a plus 2 from Strength, it's based on Strength, but we are proficient, so we add the plus 2 proficiency for a total bonus of plus 4. 
And we continue down the line like this. We get a plus one on the charisma bonus, etc. Fill them all out, keeping in mind that anything with the black dot gets the related bonus plus the plus two proficiency. And that pretty much finishes up the skills. Which brings us to part seven, perception, passive and active, and how they work. Now, perception in D&D is quite important. It's the ability to see secret doors, to see traps before you spring them, to uh, notice a key hidden in the corner, things along that line. It, it plays a lot in D&D roleplay. And you'll notice on your character sheet you have two perceptions. At the bottom of the left-hand column, you have a passive wisdom perception, and in the right column in skills, you also have a standard perception number. Here's how they differ. The perception in the skills area is active and is initiated by you. I didn't you miss. say, I'm looking for this, or I want to listen at a door to see if I hear anything. The passive wisdom perception is controlled by the dungeon master. So the Dungeon Master will do secret rolls behind his or her screen to determine whether you've noticed a secret door without looking for it, or if you're picking up on a clue in the room without actively searching for it. And to calculate that passive perception, it's fairly straightforward. You simply take your perception on skills, which is based on your wisdom, and you add 10 to it. So Bob's going to end up with a passive perception of 16, which we write in the box at the bottom. And here's our story so far. It's looking good. We're coming along. Let's take a look at that box in the bottom left and finish out left side of the sheet. And we find ourselves at part eight, talking the talk, part figuring eight. out what languages Bob speaks. Now in that bottom left box, you're going to notice there's two things, other proficiencies and languages. Let's immediately cross out other proficiencies. We need a lot more space for that. We're going to utilize this box just for languages. For the most part, languages are determined by race. So we're back in the player's handbook, page 20, dwarf section, under languages. And it says here we could speak, read, and write dwarvish and common. So let's fill them in on the sheet. Jot them in down there under your languages, and this section's pretty much done. Our sheet is looking pretty good so far. Well, that was quick. We're up to part nine now. Miscellaneous proficiencies, abilities, and skills. We're going to need some space to fill this out, so what we're going to do is we're going to go over to that features and traits section on the right side of the sheet, and we're going to cross out features and traits. What we're going to do instead is we're going to go to the top of this box, and we're going to write additional proficiencies. Then we're going to go about halfway down this box, and we're going to fill in abilities and skills. This should give us enough space to fill in what we need to fill in. So let's start filling. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to check what we get for being a dwarf by going back to page 20, dwarf section, under traits. You can see here that we have dark vision. We can see in dim and dark light conditions for 60 feet. We have dwarven resilience, which gives us advantages on saving throws against poison. And we have dwarven combat training which gives us proficiencies with axes and hammers. Back on the character sheet, under our additional proficiencies, we write down the axes, the battle axe and the hand axe, and we write down the hammers, the light hammer and war hammer. Smash, smash. Under abilities and skills, we write down dark vision and dwarven resilience. What I like to do under the abilities and skills is jot a little note in parentheses next to the skill or ability so I don't have to dig through the handbook to find out what it is. I can see what it is at a quick glance. As we continue reading through dwarf traits in the right column, we see we have a choice of a tool proficiency, smith tools, brewer's tools, or mason's tools. We're going to take smith tools and say that Bob did some metalwork repair on the ships that he was on. As a dwarf, he's familiar with stonework, so he also gets stone cunning which gives him bonuses to identify maybe the age of stonework and perhaps even who cut the stonework. And finally, as a hill dwarf, Bob's got some dwarven toughness, meaning that every level he goes up, he can add an additional hit point to his overall hit point total. And back to the character sheet, under additional proficiencies, we add our smith's tools. And under ability and skills, we add our stone cunning and our dwarven toughness. 
Next, we're off to the cleric section under class features, page 57. And we can see here that we have proficiencies in light armor, medium armor, shields, and simple weapons. And we take those proficiencies and write them down under additional proficiencies on the sheet. Lastly, we're going to go to our background section. We're going to go to Sailor on page 139. And we're going to see that we have tool proficiencies from our previous career in navigation tools and water vehicles. We also have a special feature here called Ship's Passage, which means that if we're ever in a port or in need of any type of sea transportation, we, through our contacts, we're able to get free passage on a ship if needed. And back to the character sheet again. We get those navigation tools and water vehicles under additional proficiencies, and we get that ship's passage under abilities and skills. Finally, I'm going to write spellcasting here under abilities and skills. Clerics are a spellcasting class. Uh, it's just that with everything we're doing here, it's going to be too much to go into this in this episode. Uh, the next episode will cover the ins and outs of spellcasters and how they work. And here we are, part 10, personality okay. traits, ideals, bonds, and flaws. Mm -hmm. Let's look at this block in the top right. Uh, seems interesting. A lot of nice stuff there. Put a big X through it. Forget about it. Forget about if it. If you want to look into it later, feel free. For now, really not necessary. It's dead to me. And in part 11, the armor, money. stuff we have, money and supplies. Goodbye. And that journey will start here in the equipment section in the bottom middle of the sheet. Now equipment, starting equipment, is based on your class and background. So let's go back to the cleric section, page 57, under class features, there's a section that says equipment. equipment. Now there are five lines here and you could choose one option from each line. Now, in Bob's case, I think I'm going to choose a mace. He is face. proficient in warhammers, and they do do more damage, but they're large and unwieldy, and I wouldn't think they would be ideal for shipboard use. For his armor selection, we're going to go with leather for much the same reason. It won't rust at sea, and if he falls in the water, it's not going to weigh him down and drag him to the bottom. From the next line, Bob's going to choose a light crossbow and 20 bolts, which are small arrows that the crossbow fires. Uh, just so he has a distance weapon and he doesn't have to get up close to do all the dirty work. On the next line, Bob's got a choice of a priest pack, which is something a cleric gets. Uh, in his case, it would be some vestments and some equipment for worshipping whatever dwarven god he worships. Or an explorer's pack, which is filled with interesting things like rope and rations and torches. We're going to go with the explorer's pack. And finally, under class features, he's going to get a shield and a holy symbol. Again, that would just be a symbol representative of whichever dwarven god he worships to identify him to other clerics and other dwarves. And finally, in equipment, we go over to the sailor area of background on page 139. And we see here he gets a belaying pin, uh, which acts as a club or a weapon. He gets 50 feet of silk rope, a lucky charm, and some clothing, which we assume he has anyway. And we go right back over to our equipment section and write it all in. We can also see down here that we have a pouch containing 10 gold pieces, or GP. Gold is a primary currency in the game. It's kept track of here on the left of the equipment side. And let's take a closer look at that. We're going to take that 10 gold, and we're going to write it just outside that little gold piece box that says GP. So as we're figuring out the money, we're also going to figure out any starting money we have from our adventuring career. Show me the money! In the handbook, page 143, under handbook. the equipment section in chapter 5, you'll see on the left-hand side there is a starting wealth by class chart. To figure out the additional gold that Bob brings to the table, we look up cleric, we roll a four-sided die five times, add the numbers, and multiply by ten. I tend to be generous with the players, much like their earlier statistic rolls, and I tend to give the players maximum money. I don't want them to be worrying about money at the start of the game. I want them to have fun. So we're just going to take that 210 and add them together and stick them in the gold piece slot there. And while we're on the subject of money, let's talk about the economy in D&D &D and how it works. 
Money, money. So, in D&D, a platinum piece is the top of the line currency. Platinum rock. Underneath platinum are gold pieces. Ten gold pieces make one platinum. Ten to one. Underneath gold pieces are electrum pieces. Nobody oh, knows what? what the heck these are. Nobody uses them. Forget about them. Throw them out the window. What's uh, underneath electrum is silver. Ten silvers make a gold. Ten to and one. under silver is copper. And ten coppers make a silver. So, easy monetary values all based on tens, with copper, silver, and gold being primary currency. And here's Bob so far. We're looking pretty good. Uh, two more sections, and we should be pretty much done. Part 12! Part 12, in which we cover armor class, initiative, speed, and hit points. Let's take a look at this block right in the top middle. This is pretty important stuff right here. We're going to start in the top left of this box with armor class. AC. Now, armor class, or AC, is a number that indicates how well defended you are. It's, it's vital to combat in the game. The higher that number, the harder you are to hit. Take your best shot. If an enemy wants to do you damage, they take a 20-sided die and roll it, and they have to roll above your armor class in order to connect. Now, your armor class is determined by three factors normally. One, two, it's five. determined by the armor you're wearing, whether or not you're carrying a shield, and how well you dodge based on your dexterity. So here we are, back in the player's handbook. Yeah, new page this time, page 145. And on the bottom right, there's a list of all the armors in the game and their defensive values. So we take a gander at this chart and we see that leather armor gives us an armor class of 11 plus our dexterity modifier and having a shield gives us an additional plus two to that number. Rock and a shield. So let's go back to the sheet and do a little number crunching here. Leather armor is 11 plus dexterity plus two. We go to our dexterity bonus. We know our dexterity is 12. That gives us a plus one bonus. So our armor class is 11 plus one for the bonus, plus two for the shield, giving us a total armor class of 14. In order to hit us, an enemy has to roll a 14 or higher on a 20-sided die. Let's shift that 14 up into the armor class box and move on. AC 14. Just to the right of armor class is initiative. Now rolling for initiative is a pretty common phrase in Dungeons and Dragons. And what initiative is, it's when you're confronted with an enemy, you roll a 20-sided die. Whoever gets the higher number on that roll gets the first attack. Obviously, this could mean the difference between life and death. And with initiative, you get a bonus to your initiative roll based on your dexterity bonus. So just simply take that plus one dexterity bonus and put it down for initiative and add that to any initiative roll you make. Next up and to the right of initiative is speed. How quickly you move. That's a racial trait, and it's found by going back to the player's handbook. handbook. Section on dwarves, under dwarf traits, you'll see speed. And here it says your base walking speed is 25 Boom. feet. That means that in a round of game time in D&D, which lasts about 6 seconds, at a normal walking speed you'll cover 25 feet. In 60 seconds, you'll cover 250 feet. For game purposes, as most of the game occurs in rounds, we just write down 25 feet, and that's pretty much it for speed. Next up is hit dice, a very important concept in the game. This determines your hit points, or HP, which indicates your overall survivability in the game and your ability to withstand and survive attacks. Hit dice, and consequently hit points, are determined by your class. For example, a fighter who physically trains all day is going to have more hit dice and more hit points than a wizard who stays inside studying most of the time. As Bob is a cleric, he falls somewhere between the two. He's got a decent amount of hit points for survivability, but not as much as a fighter as he has spent a lot of his time in study. To determine Bob's hit points, we go back to the handbook, page 57, Clerics. Under hit points and class features, we see that the hit dice are 1d8 per cleric level. This means every level that Bob advances, he rolls an 8-sided die, 
and adds that number to his total amount of hit points. At first level, Bob gets the full amount of hit points, which is 8, plus his constitution modifier. So, at first level, Bob's hit die is an 8-sided, and that's referred to as 1d8. We can write that in there. Added to that is his constitution bonus, which is plus 3 per level. We could write that down below. And, as you may recall, Bob also has a trait of Dwarven Toughness, which gives him an additional hit point per level, so we could add that in as well. First level characters in D&D always start at maximum hit points, so we take the 8, and add our 3, and add our 1, and Bob ends up with 12 hit points to begin the game. And underneath that current hit point box is a temporary hit point box. This box is used throughout the game itself if you've got a a potion or a spell on you that alters your hit points temporarily, you could keep track of them in there. It's nothing we're really worried about right now. The final box here is the Death Saves box, and if you remember talking about saving throws earlier, it's exactly what it sounds like. When you're beaten up enough to have fallen unconscious, you start rolling a 20-sided die. If you roll above a 10, you check off a success. If you roll below a 10, you check off a failure. Three failures is death. Three successes mean you're stabilized and you don't fall any further towards the great beyond. Now we're going to take a look at these combat dynamics so you understand how this whole thing works. Bob has an armor class of 14, so for an enemy to hit him, the enemy has to roll higher than a 14 on a 20-sided die. Now, let's say the enemy's just rolled a 16, which is a hit. The enemy then rolls their damage that they've done to Bob. Let's say they roll a 5. Bob now is down to 7 hit points. In current hit points, we write in 7. Now, let's say Bob's having a bad day, the sun's in his eyes, he can't hit anything, and this enemy just keeps pounding on him. The next Watch round, the enemy Bob. does another 5 points of damage, bringing Bob down to 2. We write that in current hit points. And the round after that, he does 3 points of damage which brings Bob below zero, so we simply write a zero in current hit points. Bob is now a crumpled mess on the ground and he is unconscious, so we come down here to the bottom right on death saves. As the rest of the party continues the battle, Bob will be rolling for the next three to five rounds a 20-sided die each round. Every time he rolls over a 10, he checks off a success. Every time he rolls under a 10, he checks off a fail. If he gets three successes, he stabilizes and can be helped in the future. Three failures, and you're writing up a new character. First roll for Bob is a 14. He succeeds. So we write an X in the first success box. Bob's second roll, he rolls a 4. That's a failure. He's slipping closer to death. Next roll is a 7. Another failure. Even closer to death. And across the next two rounds, he pulls it off with a 14 again and a 19. That's three successes, he's stabilized, he's not going to die, and when the fight's over, his companions can tend to his wounds. Once you're healed up, you can erase all those notes we took and get ready to start writing again during the next fight. Part 13. And part 13, weapons, swords, bows, cider, grape gravy, very small rocks, and other things you can attack people with. And we're back to the middle part of the character sheet. We're looking just above equipment where it says attacks and spellcasting. Spellcasting, we're going to ignore for now. We're not worried about it. We are worried about the attacks. So the first thing we'll do here is we're going to go down into the equipment and take anything that's a weapon, and we're going to move it up to the top and write it in the slots to the left. In our case, we have a mace, a light crossbow with 20 bolts, which are arrows for the crossbow, and that belaying pin that we got earlier that functions as a club. We're going to take them, we're going to fill them out in the top left there under name. Now that we've got those written in, the things we're going to worry about here are the attack bonus. Like everything else, weapons get a bonus to attack, and the damage that each weapon does. You'll see next to that it's listed as type of damage. As a new player, nothing to worry about right now. If that comes into play, your dungeon master will let you know. The first thing we'll work out here is the attack bonus. So attack bonuses for weapons come from two places. 
The first is the stat or the ability point modifier that the weapon is associated with. And the second is that plus two proficiency bonus if you have a proficiency with that weapon. The default stat used for most hand weapons is strength. It takes strength to swing them and to carry them and to utilize them properly. The primary stat for weapons such as bows, crossbows that require hand-eye coordination and some weapons that are a little bit more delicate tends to be dexterity. As you continue to play the game, you'll get to know which weapons use dexterity, which weapons use strength, but here's a quick chart to give you a basic idea. So we're going to jump back into the player's handbook, page 149, and you're going to see a list of weapons. Now before we start going into the nitty gritty of each weapon, let's just focus in a little bit and go over that strength and dexterity situation again to give you a little bit better understanding. If we circle anything on the right that says finesse or throne, we can make the assumption that it's going to be based off your dexterity bonus. Any weapons that don't require hand-eye coordination and are relatively heavy melee weapons, you can make the assumption that they're going off your strength bonus. Let's take a look at what we have. Up under simple melee weapons, we have a mace and a club. Both require strength to use, our attack bonus is going to be based off our strength. So we go back to the character sheet and just to the left of mace and club we write a plus two which is our strength modifier bonus. Our crossbow on the other hand requires hand-eye coordination to mark and hit a target so that's going to be more based off of dexterity. So we take our dexterity modifier of plus one and jot that just to the left of crossbow. Now that we have our strength and dexterity modifiers, we can go to see if we have any additional proficiencies. And we can see here that we're very familiar and proficient with axes and hammers, but unfortunately we're not carrying any of those, so there's going to be no proficiency bonus applying. However, we are adept and proficient with simple weapons. So let's go back to the handbook, page 149, pointy and bangy things, and we can see simple melee weapons here, and simple ranged weapons here. And as we look into those categories, the club and the mace are both considered simple weapons, and under the ranged weapons, the crossbow is considered a simple weapon. This means that we've got a proficiency in all three of our weapons. Woo -hoo, we're gonna kick butt. We head back to our character sheet, and we add that plus two to the left of each for the proficiency bonus that we have, and then we add those numbers together and stick them over in that attack bonus column. So if we're attacking with a mace or a club, we get a plus four to hit with our attack. If we attack with a crossbow, we get a plus three to hit with it. Now that we've figured out our attack bonuses, let's figure out what type of damage we're gonna do. To sort your damage, you go and look in the handbook. We're going to find your weapon, and you're gonna look across the column. There's gonna be a listing there that has a dice number, 1d6, 1d8, 1d10. That's gonna be the die that you roll to determine your base damage. Then you're going to add your strength if you're using a hand weapon or dexterity for hand-eye coordination or finesse weapons to that roll, depending on the weapon, and then that is your total damage that you're going to do to the enemy. Let's figure that out now. We're back on page 149 of the player's handbook. And up top here, we're going to look up mace. We're gonna look in the middle column and we'll see that the mace is associated with a 1d6. So we transpose that 1d6 over into the damage column for our mace. And as this is a handheld weapon and uses strength, we take our strength bonus of plus two and add it to our damage roll. When we hit with this mace, we're gonna roll a six-sided die and add two to it, and that's gonna be the damage we do. Back to the handbook, page 149, and let's look at the crossbow. The crossbow does 1d8, and it is a dexterity-based weapon. So we fill out 1d8, add our dexterity bonus of plus one. That's our total damage when we hit with the crossbow. And last but not least, 149, the club. Club does 1d4 damage. It's a strength-based weapon. It will get a plus two based off our strength bonus. Total damage for the club is you roll a four-sided die and add two. And congratulations, you now know how to make a D&D character.
Uh, I'd advise you run through this again and either repeat the entire process or do it again and come up with your own classes and statistics while using this as a guide. Uh, thanks for sticking with us. We knew this was a big one. And here's the princess to close us out. Thank you so much. I'm happy you got here to see us. And I'm happy you subscribe to our channel. And um, make sure you hit the bell and all those other buttons. See you later. Bye.